since it's now 531, we can start the meeting. Yes. Come to order. And as I, I told some people, um, we have Brian Bashaw from BCTV recording this meeting so that uh, we will have reference and, and it will be part of the, the community record. Review and approve the minutes from the meeting of April 27th. We trust that everybody has received these minutes. Right. Yes. I move approval, Byron. And Byron, you're moving to uh, approve them as recirculated? Yes. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye or hold up a hand. Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Abstaining? Approved. Um, residents and citizen participation. The um, the minutes noted that there were no residents or citizens present in person or over the phone, and no one had submitted anything to the board for review. Is that the same thing true this month, Christine? Yes, no one has submitted anything to review. So we can move on to COVID-19 updates. Christine, you're on. Okay. <laughs> uh, so just a few updates from last month. So things are, um, staff updates is, things are still the same. We have a safety plan that we're developing to bring some more staff into the office. But for the time being, we have kept as many people as possible working remotely and mm -hmm. we still have the offices and the site offices closed at this point. Um, we do have staff that are regularly coming into the main office on shifts. One mm -hmm. person upstairs, one person downstairs. Staff are taking their temperature. Um, and they have to say that they've taken their temperature and document what it is before they come in. They need to document when they're there and when they leave. And they need to wear a mask when they're um, out of their office or around anybody else. The maintenance are doing the same. They're continuing to work alternate shifts and they are also documenting every day in addition to those items where they're working. So mm -hmm. if they've been at a certain site, we, we know where they've been um, and we're keeping them on the separate shifts so that if one, if, if one of them gets sick, they're not all out. And so we're going to do that probably until the state of emergency has been lifted. But we are looking at trying to get some staff on site, but we're still trying to figure out what the provisions would be for people to be on site. I've been on site just like in my car and driving around and I've gotten out and I wear a mask, but I have not engaged with residents um, in any capacity. I try to go really early in the morning or kind of later in the day. <laughs> and, um, and really that's for their safety as well as my own. And so- um, How I engage with you, Christine? What'd you say? Do they try to engage with you? Sometimes. And, you know, I, I'm very clear that I, I want to talk to them, that I'm always available. They can call me anytime. But for right now, you know, because of the safety situation, it's really important for me to, to keep a distance. Okay. Um, and so we've had, you know, I think that residents are still a little bit nervous. We've had a couple of um, scares and, and panics. Um, at sites, people, you know, got some information um, and there was sort of rumors going around, but so it really made me realize that people are still nervous. And so we wanna make sure that um, when we do come back, that we're as safe as possible and that the residents have a clear expectation of what we're gonna be doing. Is it so, the case that we still have no cases? As of today, we still do not have any cases. We have been very lucky. Great. So I'm feeling very fortunate, <laughs> very, yeah. very, very lucky. And so, you know, fingers crossed, we'll make it through this. And so we've been, um, but we have a plan in place in case we do have a case and we have lots of, lots of, you know, we have lots of plans now, which we really, you know, have evolved over this process. And so mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, we're in a much better shape today than we were before COVID even reared its ugly head. Um, and we are coming up with a plan and, and staff is very um, supportive of the plan of coming back with the restrictions that we'll have. Um, we did a staff survey and um, everybody responded and we got a, I got a lot of great feedback about 
the comfort level of staff. Good. Ready to move on to property updates? Sure. Yeah, just um, a couple of property updates. So the maintenance, as I said, are still are still alternating shifts and primarily doing emergency work orders and turnovers. Um, mm -hmm. We did take down the playground at Ledgewood Heights. It had been a safety concern for some time, and we had planned to take it down regardless of this situation. And so we did take it down. We cleared out that whole spot. Um, we removed all the wood chips and cleared and cleaned the gravel. And so we're hoping that for the time being, it's a spot that kids can go and ride their bikes and play in a safe contained area until we figure out what we wanna do next. When we decide what we're gonna do, we're gonna engage the residents in that process. Um, we also, um, just HUD update. Yep. Sorry, Mark. Sorry. Yeah. Is it is it the hope to rebuild the playground? You know, I thought that that's what we would do, but the more I talk to residents, the more they want a space for kids to be able to safely ride their bikes and skateboard and roller skate in a contained spot. So I don't know what it's going to look like. Huh. There's still a very small, there's like a little, a kiddo, like a baby playground there with, um, that's a, a smaller version and a swing and swing. So those remained, just the big uh -huh. wooden structure was taken out. Yeah. Um, and it was really rotted. It just wasn't, we, we repaired it over and over again. It just could not be repaired safely. And yeah. so I think it would be interesting to see what the residents see as a good use for that land. Right. Demographic. How many young children versus older children are there at Letchwood? You know, that's a good question. It seems like there's a lot of little ones, but I think it's a real mix. I think there's a lot of teenagers too, but there's a considerable amount of kids there. There's about 70 kids overall. So it's a lot of kids. Yes. Yeah. And so Probably. the basketball court tends to be where like little kids want to go in there and ride their bikes around and skateboard. And then the big kids can't play basketball. And so, <laughs> The, and people get angry because we want it just to be a basketball court. And so I think that if we're looking at a space where kids can play safely, then maybe we relook at the playground space. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, the other thing that I noticed on the portfolio manager's report, the screen, is the disinfection and then air conditioner installation. Yes. Yeah. So we are continuing to disinfect all the buildings daily. We have an outside contract that's doing that, which has been great. And um, and then cleaning the laundry room at, Le at um, Ledger Heights more often than normal, um, but really focusing on disinfecting the, uh, you know, Samuel Elliott, Red Clover, A.W. Richards, uh, yeah, those spaces. Air conditioners. Air conditioners, we put um, a notice out. So in the past, we always had a fee for air conditioner usage. When we went to RAD, we were not able to put that in the first year plan. So we're, we are unable to charge a utility charge for that this year. We will next year, but for this year, we can't. So this year is free. And um, we just ask that residents register with us so that we know that they're putting the air conditioner in and that they are checked so that they're in properly so that we're not using too much energy. Okay. And then the uh, lavender uh, monthly property management. No, I said there are two other things, the HUD updates and the FEMA. Um, sure, I'll just briefly go yeah. over, um, and I know Chris wrote about it a little too. So in terms of HUD, um, we have gotten some additional funds, COVID-19 money for our public housing property, which is Melrose Terrace, and also for our RAD properties. So we are going to be using that for any um, additional costs that we've had related directly to COVID-19. And then we're going to, um, and we've received our admin money for our RAD program, which we had been waiting on. Um, we received that in the beginning of May. So that's wonderful. So we're caught up with our RAD money. And for FEMA, we have, um, we have gotten into the FEMA and we've started to uh, put in some of our costs. So FEMA will reimburse us 75% for approved costs. And then the additional we would be taking out of the HUD money. So we're in a good place. And Chris Hart is helping us. He's done the FEMA before. So that's 
it's a very big help to have her on board to, to support us through that process. Indeed. And then move to the lavender uh, monthly property management update. I'm interested in the number of vacancies. Yes, so the number of vacancies is due to the fact that we are not, um, we're, we cannot, we're not in the process of turning over any apartments that do not have a single entry. So based on the um, rules, the stay home, stay safe, we were able, we were not able to go into those units or send people into those units until mm. um, until it was allowable. And so we've really refrained from having people go into the Samuel Elliott apartments because we know that it's such a high risk population. We have turned over a part, an apartment on the first floor. So we're hoping to get that housed this month as of June 1st, but there will be five additional units that we're gonna have to try to fill once we can get in inside. But we're really hesitant to move anyone into the building because it's a shared entry, shared elevator that we just don't mm -hmm. want to upset the apple cart until we know for sure that there's not as much of a risk. The other sites though, we are, it's sort of hard because one person, you know, we're, we're sort of moving, we're transferring a couple of people. So we're moving someone to Sam Elliott and then we're mm -hmm. going to have a little bit of a domino effect. Um, but we do have two units that we're ready to fill at Melrose and those are ready because they have private entries that we could, and so we could turn those over. The same at Moorport and Ledgewood. Um, Hayes, again, we're hesitant because of the compromised pop the population and also because they share that open space. And the mm -hmm. RCC unit just came on very recently. Mm, okay. It was a, it was a very recent um, departure. So we are, not, we will, we will be turning that over, but at this point it's, it's new still the person, the, the stuff isn't even moved out of the apartment. Okay. And the four uh, red clover, the uh, vacancy list is the state housing list rather than our public housing list? Yes. Okay. So the, the um, Vermont State Housing holds that list. Okay. They have the vouchers for that building. As we have always looked at the rent collections, that again is an issue. Rent collections yes, are down. Yes, some of these predate the um, COVID-19, <laughs> so they're not all related to COVID. Um, some of them are are things that have gone wrong, that have been behind previous to that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Are we at the point, well, post-COVID, we, we don't want to make any changes until the emergency is over. We cannot, we cannot serve a notice to evict um, at this point. There's a moratorium on eviction for, for, um, for rent. So we, there's nothing we can do at this point besides we've been sending letters saying you owe this much, you're gonna owe it eventually. Here are some resources, reach out to SEVCA, reach out to some other organizations. This is the time to catch up and we're not getting a lot of response. There is one person who has not paid their rent who has always paid their rent, but they have not paid it through this whole process and they don't have a phone, they don't answer their mail. So I think that they're just holding on to their, I think they will pay it. I think they're just holding on to their rent because they don't, they like to hand it to us in person and they haven't been able to do that. So that's one big fee that I'm not as concerned about, but the other mm -hmm. ones are really um, specific. There's no one who's, I don't think that we've really seen an increase in people not paying their rent that normally do. That's good to know. Any questions? I seem to be the one who's doing a lot of talking at the moment. <laughs> what are other commissioners? Yeah. Great. Certainly want everybody to pitch in with questions. Um, is it surprising, it, Byron, is it surprising that Melrose is as low as it is? Um, 
I think Melrose is because we have the two, we have two empty units. And so I think that that's really skewing uh, the numbers. Yeah. Cause there's only okay. 25 units there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what would the percent be uh, excluding those units? Um, well, the problem is, is because they've been vacant for more than two months, we can't get our, we can't get our hat payment either. So usually we get, or we, we can't get our, um, we're not getting any subsidy at all for those units. And so, so it's bringing it up. I don't think that we would be very far behind at all if we were, if we had those units filled. So the actual uh, existing tenant uh, rent performance is not bad. No, the actual, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's, it's really primarily based on those two units that we're so seeing this big discrepancy. So would you say without those two units, we'd be at or above 80%? Yes. Okay. That's yeah. good. Yep. I'm wondering if some of the uh, extra payments for COVID-19 could be used to fill the gap that, uh, where the subsidies weren't paid. I don't think that it can at this point. I don't. Uh -huh. And we've actually reached out to our insurance company as well to see if we could maybe get funded for interruption of business. And it was not, um, these types of events are not, you know, are excluded from this. If that's of God, if, yeah. if not. Okay. Yeah. Are we ready to move on to wellness? Yep. Laura, Laura Lai Morissette's report. I think they're doing a great job. <laughs> they are doing a great job. Well, I before some of you joined the meeting, uh, Christine and I were chatting about how the um, multiple contacts and we all received the graph of uh, the, the phone contacts yeah yes that came separately i'm sorry I'm, i need to try to move so that the sun isn't on that but the the amount of contact because we have people who are are able to do that really is setting a different pattern uh, which Christine was sharing with the other executive directors, if I'm remembering correctly, and let, let you talk a little bit more about it, Christine, because I think that the amount of direct contact by phone with all of our residents is a very important. Um, it's impressive. Yes. We do have a lot of capacity to call. We have a lot of residents, but we also have we have more capacity than some other organizations have. And so I think we took this as an opportunity to set up a very deliberate way of reaching out to residents on a regular basis. And so it's been very helpful. Um, and they do, you know, they make they make calls and calls and calls every day. We we hired a part time person that's working 20 hours a week that's just supporting them and making and triaging calls and triaging information to them and she started the beginning of last week and um she has been wonderful she worked at a hotel and she got laid off and she wanted to do some work and so she wanted to get into some sort of social service she has a lot of customer service background and so she has been really great and that's a direct COVID expense so we've 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 utilized that. Um, I think that because we've had this capacity, we've learned a lot about what our residents need and what the community needs are. A lot of times, we we come up with some strategies. Like, you know, we usually do this big food distribution program, which we always need. And there were some staff that really wanted to do that again, and I couldn't think of a way to do it safely. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't feel comfortable with it. So I said, well, let's look at the numbers and see who needs food. And we really started to realize that nobody needs food right now. Everybody's been getting stuff. We have connections in Brattleboro. We're really lucky in Brattleboro because we've been working with the, the food bank and the food connects and they have our food works, which is through groundworks. 
and mm -hmm. some volunteers and they've been delivering boxes of food. So people are doing okay. So we figured out that that's not where they need us. They need us in other places. They need, they need a lot of support around isolation, being able to talk to somebody every day or every couple of days for 15 to 20 minutes. They need that. Are we setting up a pattern that we want to continue after the emergency is over? You know, I and think that's, that's a good question. I think that we will, we will, yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that this, hopefully we can carry on some of the things we've been doing through afterwards, because I think we've learned a lot about what people need. Christine, were you able to find out if there's any um, organizations out there that could help fill that gap that I had brought up at the last meeting? I, yeah, and I brought it doing anything. Yeah, I brought it up to Lorelai, who's running this group, and I asked her what she thought and and also about what other resources there are. There is a warm line through HCRS and they have been they have been putting people in that direction, like giving people that information about the warm line, which is just a, a soft touch of somebody, a, a resource. And I think Lorelai felt that at this point, our residents weren't looking for something to call into together. They were really looking for that reassurance of someone one-on-one -on -one to talk to them. But maybe that's something going forward as, as things ease up a little that people might be more interested in. Mm. And I think that Thrive, which is our employee assistance program, would be interested in doing something like that for a fee. Yeah. Good. The um, Sash is so much involved with that. And I was interested that the percentage of um, but only 18% of the calls had to do with health. Mm -hmm. Yes, and those are primarily being directed right to the wellness nurse um, mm -hmm. and some of the SASH coordinators. And we brought in um, an additional uh, part-time SASH wellness nurse, the person who works in Valley Cares. She had been working mm -hmm. remotely and she had another job in Springfield that she was furloughed from. So um, we hired her to do 10 hours a week temporarily to help us catch up on some of the SASH mandated right. work so that the nurse could then do more COVID response work. Wonderful. And certainly we'll take advantage of uh, employees that Springfield can't use. Mm -hmm. um, then the um, family self-sufficiency which is certainly hard to uh, work from home for Lucy Tell. That seems like quite a lot of participants, 35. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has been, it's been a struggle. I think Lucy really enjoys seeing people face to face. And I think she really likes that type of work. I think it's been a challenge for her as well as the participants, but she has been working with her supervisor, who's Lorelai, at coming up with a, um, a calendar for next month with some online events to support people right. um, around financial success. So they should have something they're putting, I know they're, Lorelai and I talked about it today, they're putting something together right now. So that should be coming out for next month. Just this is an off the top question. Um, what would be your guesstimate of how many residents actually have computer uh, access so that they might be able to take a look at Zoom and communications and stuff like that? I think it depends on the site. So I think at our family sites, I think that people have a lot of most, a lot of people have smartphones. So they're able to do it with their phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Thank I you. think at our senior sites, it's it's lower. Yeah. I did ask Rotary a couple of weeks ago about the masks, and they have already been inundated with requests from nursing homes and the places. Yeah. And they didn't feel like they could promise anything at this point, uh, but they would let me know if once they got through their current obligations, um, they would get in touch. So I, I did you. ask. 
Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, just not to go off on that, but I will a little bit. Um, we did get, we have been getting a lot of masks. Good. We received quite a bunch and we've been mailing them out. We've been labeling them um, depending on what kind they are, like whether they tie, they're elastic, whether they're round or rectangular. And then um, when people request them, we've been mailing them out. We've been getting a lot of requests, so that's good. And we're asking, you know, we're starting to put new notices up, really asking family members to wear masks. So I ordered a hundred cloth masks which came in last week and we're going to be putting them at the sites for people to take so that when they come in, they put them on and then they take them home with them. Good. That's wonderful. Because we're finding that a lot of people coming in our building are not wearing masks. Yeah. How will you enforce or at least encourage mask wearing in the buildings? So we have some new signs that come up, you know, before it said, please just, you know, wear them or, you know, we're, we were really, it was hard, it was easier to be stricter, but now as things are loosening up around the state, it's, um, I think we're going more like towards the angle of thank you so much for caring about our residents and protecting them. Okay. Thank you so much for wearing your mask, you know, thank you so much. Oh, you forgot yours. Grab one. They're right here. You know, right. and to try to go at it that way. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. The housing choice voucher program, uh, the yellow this time. I'm glad that he was able to say, uh, we've been informed we can finally expect payment of the RAD admin costs sometime in May, and they have come in. So that, <laughs> and we did, yeah. So there will be seven people taking housing choice vouchers at Melrose rather than expecting to move into uh, Red Clover 2. So there will only be 18 units at Red Clover 2. So we'll have seven people, but we, we're in the process now of doing a light survey, basically a survey that says, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to confirm, it doesn't have to be definite, but what are you already feeling? Because we know that there are some people that just are not going to want to go. So Chris is working on that right now as part of her development job to figure out how many people who are, you know, are really sure that they're not going to go. And that will give us a better gauge. And um, hopefully some people will go into our public housing. Some people will take vouchers, but but if a lot of people decide they don't want to go to, it's hard to know what we're going to do because if many people decide they don't want to go to Red Clover too, we might have more spots available. Okay. And so then we'd have to rehouse the other people. Are, are there is Byron? Are there some people at Melrose who will want to go to Red Clover too, and we have to find temporary housing for? Um, I cannot imagine that the 18 residents are going to want to go to Red Clover too. I would be very surprised, but I could be wrong. And that's why we're trying to find out from the survey. There are many people at Melrose right now who had the opportunity to go to Mel to go to Red Clover one and did not want to go. Okay. But if you, if you, am I misunderstanding if, if you have anybody who wants to go to Red Clover two, and it's not yet going to be open. Um, is there a temporary housing problem? No, they would just stay where they are at Melrose until until oh. we're ready to house them. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Well, if they don't want to go to Red Clover 2 and Melrose is eventually going to go away. That means they have to find other housing. 
within our system or so they would either they would so they will have an option they'll have the option to go to another one of our housing sites or they will have an option to take a voucher to move into the community and move somewhere else okay kind of like a sec it would be a section 8 voucher so a, a a voucher that they could take to live somewhere else and so i think david put something in here um he's trying to talk to Wyndham windsor to see if maybe they would reserve a few spaces mm -hmm. for us but i don't but i don't know if that's a possibility things are a little bit up in the air right now because there's a lot of people right now also working on home on on trying to figure out the homeless situation in Brattleboro some, since so many people are housed at the hotel. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of work around that as well. And so I, I think right now it's a little too early for us to try to hold any spots for anybody anywhere. But we we are going to secure that there's vouchers so that if they need to go in the community, they will have that and they'll have plenty of time to look. We're we're going to offer it to them nice and early so they have lots and lots of time. Good. But we have we have the vouchers. We have the vouchers. Okay, great. And and when is Red Clover two gonna be ready? We're not looking at we are looking at um two thousand and twenty one to to get everybody in by January first, two thousand twenty two. Okay. For that date. And so the hope is, is that the building will be complete in October mm -hmm. or earlier than October. I think we were hoping that everything would be complete and sometime in, in early summer and that we would have six months to move everybody in. Okay. Remember, fast construction. Yeah. Well, the idea would be the breaking ground now and that, you know, sometime in this, this summer, or, or at least getting some of the work done and then the construction will go through um through the winter and then into the following year so we're looking at about a year and a half from now mm -hmm. i'm trying to think of where chris is and maybe my timeline's a little off what she uh do, 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 do. she's talking about 11 month construction yeah 11 month Yep. So closing this June and then an 11 month construction. And so needing to have everybody in no later than um, December 31st of 2021. Remembering that the original residents of Red Clover Commons were rushed in because we needed to have occupancy by the end of the year i believe or yeah and this building is going to be much much plainer than that building this is a very scaled down version the apartments will be similar but they won't have the same community space they'll they'll be using the community space at red clover commons one mm -hmm. and what does their status have to be at at two <clears throat> like a section eight or which one of these programs does that fit into what was it? I missed it. It froze for a second, Don. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if I'm wording it right, but what one of the which one of these programs does Red Clover Commons one or two fit into? So they're a project-based voucher. So they're okay. so yep. Yeah. So Red Clover one, the vouchers are held by Vermont State Housing. Red Clover two, we will hold the vouchers for the program so we'll hold the vouchers and we'll be managing the building part of the difference between the vouchers that we're going to give people who don't want to move into red clover too is that those are like section eight and are, are the, the basically the property of the resident who has it whereas project-based voucher they we have the voucher and they move into have the voucher while they're in that uh, residence but it doesn't yeah, the voucher over. stays yeah, the, yeah that's a good way of saying janet yes thank you the voucher stays with the with the unit and so when they're living there they pay 30 percent of their income in that and it's based in that unit very similar to the way many of our housing you know our public housing so it's based on they can't take it with them however they are eligible after a year to to then go into a program that has a section 8 voucher that but, I only if there's, but only if they're available. Okay. And Section 8 and, are not easy to come by. 
And so we'll hold the wait list for the Red Clover 2. Right now, we don't hold the wait list for the Red Clover 1 building, but we will for the Red Clover 2. Okay. And people Good. will have to apply. It sounds you know weird, but people will have to apply separately for that building hmm. than Red Clover 1. How do you keep it all straight? <laughs> Good grief. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, we've the RAD demonstration update on funding. I think we've already covered that. And we can move on to a financial review with the check listings in green. And then um, the Red Clover Commons and talking about how how separate our financing is the, uh, the 2019 budget versus the actual. Looks very good. I keep looking for the parentheses that say lost yeah. and they're not there, which is wonderful. I had a couple of questions on the budget when we get there. We're here. Okay. Um, Red Clover Commons 2019 budget versus actual. Um, Line 4,900 miscellaneous income. Um, in 2019, it was uh, projected versus actual 600 to 3311. What was the increase on that? It probably, oh, it probably had to do with some sort of damage. I believe we had a water damage. Somebody had a bathtub that oh. had um, overflowed and yeah. damaged down through the building. And so okay. I'm, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm guessing that's what it was, that a, that a resident was billed for some sort of damage. Sure. And on um, line 7170, janitorial, it went from 12,000 to 6,900. That was a pretty good savings. Um, was there a reason we didn't spend the 12,000? 12, uh, 12, I think it was just that that's what we had budgeted for. And I think that we ended up going with a different cleaning company that okay, was less expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So I was looking at major discrepancies and stuff like that. Wanting to understand that. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that that 3000, even though we have damages above, I, I will double check for you. Um, but I believe that it had to do with some sort of additional be that we ended up being able to charge based on some of some of that situation, but I'll double check. Sure. Sure. So the insurance, I mean, minor discrepancies, but taxes and insurance actual was more than uh, 91,050 versus 92, almost 93,000 for taxes yeah. and insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tax, the property tax was higher. Yes. It's really helpful to have these breakouts. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is really good, Christine. Yeah, I know. It looks nice. Isn't it good? <laughs> and next month, we'll have even more information for you. Our fee accountant has been doing a lot of great work. Mary helped a lot with this. So this is, it is, it doesn't make a big difference. So I'm excited as things start to, you know, our accounting starts to get back into normalcy that it's nice to be able to see things that are yep. clear to understand. And these yes. are, uh, accountings are always going to come out in the black. Like the Richards building? I, 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 you know, the Richards building has never done well. It's been always been a tough building, but they have done, you know, I have to say our property management has done an amazing job at keeping it full. And she has worked a lot with David on getting people with vouchers into the building. And that has made a huge difference. This, that, their partnership has really changed that the A.W. Richards building. And I think that Courtney should get most of the credit, but David needs to get some credit too. They've worked really hard together to get this where it needs to be. Well, I remember Chris Hart saying that the heating system in uh, uh, A.W. Mm -hmm. Richards was difficult to work with and expensive so that there wasn't very much that we could do to reduce 
the costs there. That is true. It is true. It's still the case. But it came in the black. You, you yeah. quite right, Byron. <laughs> Any other comments? That was good. So moving to check signing. Um, Byron, you're you're sending checks in May. Yes. Yeah, and I apologize. So for the time being, um, we really need to keep doing it in the evening if possible, just because Billy Joe, that's when Billy Joe is able to get in. Mm -hmm. So if that works for people, that would be great. If it doesn't work for people, then I could set up a time on Friday mornings to have people come in, but I'm not, I'm not normally there on Friday. So it would take, you know, it would take maneuvering some of the schedule around a little. If you I need have to no problem coming in in the evening. Yeah, I, I can only come in maybe before three, but if they were left in the room where I normally sign the checks, I could sign them and then Billy Joe could pick them up when she comes in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have anybody come into the office just for me, but uh, you know, I, I can't do it after three. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, well, right now Byron has done it. I don't know if just for June we could get someone who, yep, Elizabeth. Um, I can do June instead of July if you want. Okay, let's, I, is that okay? It worked out well for me to go in at seven design checks too. So I'm happy to swap with you or go in for June. So either, yeah. either way works out well for me. The time in the evening, I'm, I'm free afternoon and evening on Thursday, so that's no big deal. So which would you prefer, June or July? Doesn't matter. What's, what's good for you? Either one will work for me, too. Okay, so um, how about I'll take June and you take July? Sounds good. Okay. Okay, great. And then, what time? What time should I be there on, in the evening? I'll I've let been, Billy Joe reach out to you. She usually sets up the time, and I that's think fine. that's okay. fine. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going there about quarter to seven. That's fine. So that that works. Yeah. And the first time, not the first time, second time I did it, I signed everything in my car and discovered that some of the checks had slid down to the left side of my <laughs> So I had to turn around and drive back. <laughs> so from there on in, I put my mask on and came in and signed things. Yeah. <laughs> Very oh. helpful. Oh. Disconcerting. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. I transition to uh, be accountant. You were saying that uh, we're going to have even more um, complete uh, and detail and things that will be helpful to work with. Let me oh, let certainly. me double check that I'm not lying to you about, about June. Hang on. Let me just look at my schedule here. Thursday, the 4th, 5th, 11th, 5th, 18th. It's fine, the 25th. Yeah, I'm clear for, uh, for June. That's fine, perfect, good. good. All right. And I will make sure I have July. Oh, really? okay. Yep. Hopefully if okay. when I'm out of quarantine, I might be able to pull my weight here. That's okay, don't you, worry about it, you know. Don't worry about we it. We all do what we have to do. I don't yeah. go anywhere, I, you know, nowhere. No, don't worry, don't worry. Christine, I just want to compliment you and the staff and the people you've hired to keep in touch with everybody about standing work to keep everybody safe and work with the residents. I mean, my hat's off to you, it really is. You know, great job. Yes. Thank you. 
They have done an amazing job and our staff has done great. And, you know, I'm looking at ways to uh, help them to feel appreciated. And so I'm working on some of that this week. And um, because I realize that not just saying, you know, I appreciate you, but also coming up with some ways of giving them some time off because I find that people are not taking time off right now that really everybody needs some time off right now. It's been very traumatic. And so, so giving people time off to use within the next month saying, I'm giving you additional time, but you got to use it. And then I'm also <laughs> sending them each a present, something little in the mail, just to say, thank you, a handwritten card and a little gift. Um, mm -hmm. But if you, you know, I think that coming from the board, that's very, helpful and so i don't know maybe we could write a letter from the commissioners to the staff and just celebrate all the hard work they're doing i think, I think that would be maybe a paragraph from each of us that's a great idea yes because even if it's a little duplicative it's still okay it's something from each of us would make it more personal i think that's yeah. excellent wonderful I agree. I think that would be really great. Yeah. Well, maybe nice. if we each did our paragraph and sent it to Christine in the next week or so. Absolutely. Yeah. We could Definitely. put it into a letter and send it yeah. out. Yeah. Yep. That's what I was going to suggest, that we need a deliver by such and such a time. So yeah. next week will lead us into Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, so, if I could get it by maybe, that, maybe the end of the day on Tuesday. Perfect. Be glad to. And the sooner I get them, if everybody sends it to me before, then I'll put it together faster. But and I'll make sure that the staff, everybody gets a copy, and I'll also post it on our website and our Facebook. And that way, it's not just to them, but the the community knows as well how you're feeling. That would be yeah, great. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's Good a great idea. idea. Individual statements. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. And so that would be Tuesday the 26th yeah yep we'll have it to you by the good good thank you that's a great idea that's wonderful thank you very yeah. much yeah well i think we all feel so indebted to all of the work that the staff is doing that oh, it, it would be a great way to to express that um that's the last okay. excuse me go ahead did you say something, Donna? I was talking to my dogs. Two <laughs> 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 Bernese mountain dogs, you know? Yep. You're on the, uh, there will be large projects in progress. Uh, FEMA PDMA. So, yeah, I think that's um, yellow. Oh, no, I'm not sure what color, Chris. Orange. 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 <laughs> um so yes so we talked a lot about red clover too i think you you we talked about that that we're we're hoping to close on with the construction starting right after june 15th which is very soon um and so we're very excited about that and um we're very hopeful that it will happen quickly um even though we have the current pandemic but but it looks like there there are provisions for um construction so we're in a good place well, June fifteenth was the end of the uh, or end of the emergency, according to what I've heard from the governor just recently. Yeah, right. Oh, that auspicious. Um, BDMA Melrose FEMA project. Um, so we have um, we are trying to get some of this work done um, this summer. The demolition of the remaining buildings um, and, and it's really needed now we have found that we found some vandalism in one of the empty units um, and it, I think it's really imperative at this point that we get them done we had to shore them all up today again to to block entry because people are going in there and so uh, yeah um, I think we did great for a very long time, but I think our time is up, so it's time to get going. So that sort of that put a little bit of a fire under them as well, and um, so they're really working on it. They're they're going to bring someone in again to take out a lot of the um, 
items that are reusable and then we have to do the abatement and then we'll be tearing them down. So we're hopeful that that gets done this summer. I cannot wait. I would, I just, it's like the playground. I'm, I'm, I've just needed to be, I want it to be over. <laughs> I want to get it down. It's just not safe and I'll, I'll feel better once they're not there. Well, unfortunately it uh, squatters once they yeah. know something this is there mm -hmm. the sooner the better. Um, yeah. The moving to work MTW waiting so on notice. We're still waiting. No news. No news. And I guess that's good because we're not in the position right now to work on it anyway. <laughs> so, um, but we're still in the lottery, so that's good. And um, and Chris is working with FEMA on the completion of the Melrose, um, pulling down the buildings and widening the brook, but also on an, on the COVID related expenses. Okay, that's all I have on this agenda. Any uh, items that commissioners want to bring up? No, I think that's good. I, if I could stay on for a moment with Christine and get a little tutelage for stupid old people about uh, getting on other than by phone. Sure, I will happy. I'm happy to help. Thank you. I would say inexperienced rather than stupid would be much more appropriate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh, absolutely. absolutely. I would not be able to help. I'm not sure. Um, because I'm not coming in the same way you are. I have an account and so I just log into my account. Yeah. And so you all are are coming in. And so I don't know, maybe one other person will stay on and let us know how they came in via the video. Okay. okay. I simply on the link in your email to us. And I had downloaded uh, moving to work. Yeah, I had so downloaded I... moving to work, and that made a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Byron, I I really try to make sure that people know that we're immigrants in this world. We're not natives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I say it frequently. I... My grandchildren roll their eyes, but they said they'll help you. So, uh, do well, I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Not, ah, okay. I'll second it. Okay. Elizabeth and Donna, all those in favor, please say aye and hold up hands. Aye. Aye. aye.